we t- last couple of weeks, uh, we've been ministering along the lines of s- uh, seven steps of spiritual growth. Now, not to be confused with our Sunday services, we're talking about growing up spiritually. They're, they're two different things now, growing up spiritually and seven steps of spiritual growth. I mean, you can say, well, they're the same, well, they're not, because we're kind of on the Sunday services, kind of paralleling, you know, growing from babyhood to childhood to adulthood. But on Wednesday nights, we're talking about these seven points about how to, how to um, grow spiritually, not, not grow up from babyhood to adulthood, but how to grow spiritually, you know. And even when you reach adulthood, you need to grow spiritually. I mean, even once you reach the stage of being an adult, you're not fully grown emotionally, mentally, um, socially. There's still a lot of things you've got to do in life. You're going to spend the rest of your life getting there. It'll be amazing when you get to about 60 or 70 how, how much wisdom you had that you didn't have at 30, you know, and especially at 20, you know. I mean, you know, uh, we, we, all, we kind of refer to that, that 18 to 25-year range as the Y and D range, young and dumb. Hello? And, of course, when you're that age, you know, between, uh, between about 15 and 30, you think your parents are stupid. And then when you get to 30, you think, my God, they got smart the last 15 years. What happened to y'all? Y'all really got some wisdom in the past. No, you just figured out that they actually knew what they were talking about. Hallelujah. They, they, knew, they knew some stuff. Hallelujah. So uh, a couple weeks ago, we started this. You know, the first point was learning to forget. So there, these are all learnings, okay? The first one was learning to forget the past. You can't be held in captivity to what you did before you got saved. You just can't. You cannot live your life, you know, regretting the fact. You know, think of what the Apostle Paul, think about Paul. Now, he, he held the coats of the men who stoned Stephen to death, the first martyr of the church. And the Bible says he was consenting unto his death. It, it so shaped and formed him that later we find in the Bible he, that he was breathing out threatenings going after the Christians. So much so that Jesus had to take him out. Hello? He got knocked off that horse for a reason. Because Jesus came to get him saved or to send him to hell. That was his day. He was going to hell that day or he was going to get saved. That was his choices. Are you here? You know, some people think, you know, all oh, the Lord has special. No, no, no. Jesus, he said, he said, Saul, Saul, why thou persecutest thou me? His question, he didn't come up and say, hey, why don't you get saved and follow me, Paul, or Saul? He said, why are you persecuting me? And then he said, it's hard for you to kick against the pricks. In other words, buddy, you have run up against something you don't know how to deal with here. Come on now. It wasn't a social call. It was a Mr. T, I pity the fool call. All right? So Paul wrote later in his life, he said, this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. I press toward the mark of the high calling that's in Christ Jesus. So you have to forget the past. Put it under the blood and forget it. Come into the kingdom, forget it. Sin, repent, get it under the blood, forget it. Don't let the past govern your life. Your failures govern your life. Second, we said learn to forgive. You got to forgive folk. You got to give them the same grace you want from God. That went over big. If you want it, you got to give it. Now, Jesus, you know, and you say, well, this is old covenant, but listen to the principle he gave here. If you don't forgive others, your father's not going to forgive you. So, in other words, having the heart of of the forgiver is imperative to your successful life. Amen. Thank you for your enthusiasm. Number three was. Um, learning, you know, learning to pray. Church needs to understand that prayer is not big flowery speeches and oratory, uh, you know, uh, the eloquence of an oratory ability to be flowery and hit for other people to hear. Prayer is communication with God. Prayer is communication with God. We want to be able to communicate with the Father and be, you know, and, and have, listen, you, you don't walk up to your spouse and go, oh, unless you're Shakespeare, oh, how I loveth thee. Thou art, you know, the rose of Sharon in my life. You are, thou art, you know, most beautifulest of all things. 
You don't talk to, you don't talk to your spouse that way. I mean, you might be saying, hey, baby, you look mighty hot tonight. Come on. Isn't that right? I mean, you, you get right there and you just communicate a level y'all can understand. Isn't that right? Well, when we talk to God, we need to communicate the level. You know, he, he can communicate with you the level you understand. You don't have to get all flowery. You don't have to start calling him God. Duh! And almost choke saying God. Get weird. No, prayer is communication with God. Now, communication is a, what kind of street? Two-way street. Communication is a two-way street. It involves, if you're communicating, it involves speaking and listening. If, hello, if you are simply going in and doing all the talking and you're not listening to what God has to say back, it's a speech. Y'all hear you going home. Didn't Bible didn't say when you stand speaking. It said when you stand praying. Amen. So <clears throat> our communication with God is not a speech, but it is a conversation. Come let us reason together. Amen. Let's be involved in dialogue. Amen. You talking to God about things, him, him answering you. Amen. You, now listen, effective prayer is always based on what his word says. In other words, it's foolish to approach God um, and ask him about things he's already stated and established a position on in his word. Lord, if it's your will, will you heal my body. Well, See, you know, now, now you're not in faith. You're, you're, you're trying to find out something now. Now, listen, the Holy Spirit, if you'll listen, and you're saying if, he'll correct you and tell you where to go find out the truth. So, you know, the Bible says, and here, <laughs> we'll go back over to Mark or go back over to here. You know, the Holy Spirit will guide you and lead you into truth. But you've got to be listening. You can't go and that's another thing. Whining speeches aren't prayer. Oh, God, I don't know why you did that. That's not prayer. You've got to learn to pray. We talked about that already. Learn to believe. You've got to learn what it, what it means to believe God as a believer. Now, we've got some unbelieving believers out there. I said we have some unbelieving believers out there. They don't believe God. They, they, they don't believe the Word. You know, they, they love God. This is, they, they do love God. They're born of God. But they don't know how to believe God. They don't put their trust in Him. They want Him to do stuff, but they haven't learned how to get over into the realm of faith and learn how to believe and receive from God. You need, if you're going to grow spiritually, you need to do that. Five, learn to worship. Now, last week we spent a lot of time on this, and we got, we got kind, of, kind of hung up. And not in, the, not in a bad sense, but we kind of got hung up there. I thought we were going to finish last week. We got hung up there, so we had to stay there. But learn to worship. And we got to talking about uh, the heart of the worshiper was an attitude. Amen? It's not how many slow songs you sing. It's not how many fast songs you sing. It's not how many vertical songs and how many horizontal songs you sing. You know, vertical man to God, God to man, and horizontal, you know, corporate body, ministry one to another, that kind of thing. No, worship starts in the attitude of the heart. Amen? So it can be a humdinger of a camp meeting, you know, 25 beats a minute song. I don't know if anybody can do that or not. Or it can be a, you know, 10 beats, a, you know, a minute song. I mean, not a minute, a second. <laughs> Nathan's got some guitar things, runs that he's having to do, and, and he, he's, his teacher can do them. And, you know, he, he just sits there and goes, how do you get that many, many whatever's in a second? You know, how, many can you, how many can you move your fingers that fast, you know? Well, if you want to play fast, you got to practice slow. I keep telling you that. I got that from somebody else. You know, if you want to practice, if you want to play fast, you got to practice slow. You got to get all the, you got to go over and over and over until the memory's there, and then you can speed it up. Hallelujah. But you know what? You know, it doesn't matter if the rhythm is this way or that way. Is it has to start? Now, listen. I understand different different settings need different things. Now, me, I love to preach, but if you're gonna preach, it's hard to preach right after I love you, Lord. It sets a different atmosphere. The atmosphere, I love you, Lord, sets a different atmosphere of ministry. Whereas, you know, I got the Holy Ghost 
I got the Holy Ghost in my hands and my feet. I, that, that, that takes it to a different place. Y'all understand what I'm saying? It's a different styles, and I, I get all that. But in all of those, all those things, all the different ranges, all the different styles, all the different music, all the different cultural backgrounds involved in the music, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, the place it starts is in the heart. The true worshipers of God worship him in spirit and in truth. In other words, it's coming out of the Holy Ghost and out of the Word. We don't need no whiny worship songs. Probably, usually they're not whiny worship songs, they're whiny complaining songs. You know, please let me sing in the choir, in the choir. Please let me sing in the choir. If you've never heard that, you need to go find it on YouTube and hear it. Just so you have a reference point to one of the dumbest songs ever written. And if you're out there and you wrote it, I'm sorry. It's a get-back song because Uncle Charlie didn't get to sing in the choir, but he got there on the Sunday morning after he died, and he was singing in the heavenly choir. Take that. Folks, if you can't sing, you don't need to be in the choir. You'll mess up the whole thing. Amen. Trust me, I've never joined the choir. I won't join the choir. You know, y'all let me get away with a little bit on doing some stuff here and there, but you know, you're not going to find me in a choir. The three people around me are going to have to have earplugs. All right. Anyway, that's all kind of off to the side. Heart worship starts with the heart. Now, we go further with it than that, but that's the starting place. The attitude of the worshiper has to be right. So the attitude of the worshiper has to be right. Amen? All right. Let's move on tonight now. We've kind of just recapped everything. We're not we, long. We only have two more points left, and they're not real long. But let's go over to Luke, the sixth chapter. Luke chapter six. The sixth thing you'll need to do to help you grow in spir spiritually is to learn to give. Now, Jesus says in Luke 6, 38, he says, Give, and it shall be given unto you. Woo, glory. Good measure. Pressed down, shaken together, and running over shall men give into your bosom. For with the, look, underline this part. For with the same measure ye meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. Now, I'm going to say something here. I know, that, you know, we could go ahead and start talking about percentages or amounts and that kind of stuff, what measure of meat. I think it's also referring to the attitude with which you me your meat, measure is meat. Is meat. <laughs> What a word. The, same, the attitude of how you measure. You know? Let's face it. Now, Jesus stood up there one day, and a woman walked up, and they're all kind of watching the, uh, the treasury at the, at the temple. And this woman walks by and puts two pence or, you know, or whatever, the, you know, whatever that would be in their time. Just say two cents in, in relation to us. It's our smallest form of money is a penny. We don't have a smaller form of currency exchanging than a penny that's the smallest we've got you can't give somebody a half a penny it'd be worth more than a penny if it would you did but it's, it's still because copper's worth more than the penny is now but still you you, you can't get some, so her she gave the two the, the two pence she put and then jesus stopped and just said this war this woman has given more than anybody else today i'm paraphrasing a little bit but you know this is the essence of it of course, they're all looking at him like, well, I mean, I saw Daddy Rich folks walk down here and put, you know, a thousand, a thousand dollars in a day. And she walks by and put two penny up there. You know, he says, because everybody else gave out of their abundance, she gave all she had. She gave everything she had. She gave her all for the things of God. Others just gave what they could comfortably afford. And there's a big difference. If you can find that, that's fine. I won't, I won't be able to see if y'all find that back there. <clears throat> Think of Jesus saying and stopping, stopping everything to say she'd give more than everybody. Anybody there? Because she gave her all. So what's he saying? Attitude. <clears throat> Attitude is as important as anything. Excuse me for that little whatever high-pitched Thingy. Attitude is just as relative or more relative than amount. How many of you ever been in, now, you don't have to raise your hand, but how many of you ever been in a meeting 
and they would take up an offer, and they were saying, well, you know, who will give $1,000, who will give $5,000, who will give 10000 And you felt, I can only give five, you felt like yours wasn't even worth it. The Lord doesn't see it that way. Now, men may, but the Lord does it. And let's face it, who, who is the important one in the first place? Men of the Lord. Now, I know, you know, sometimes you'll, you'll be at a, a meeting and, and they'll, need, they'll have needs at the ministry and they'll, they'll say, look, we need this X number of dollars and we really need, uh, you know, so who'll start out? You know, somebody said, well, I'll give $10,000. and somebody, I'll match, I'll give $50,000. That's fine, I get that. Sometimes you have to have those things happen. Those, you know, and I'm thinking, well, man, we need to come to our church and say, hey, who, who'll give, you know, $500, who'll give 1000 you know. You know. Sometimes you think, well, we need to do that. And there are, there's, that's not wrong to do it, Okay. It's not wrong to do that. If you have a need, you know, and you, and you need to express that need and, and have people contribute to it, that's okay. All right? But a lot of times, the people who can only give 5 or $2 or $3 or whatever feel completely left out. No, you start where you are. Being a giver is not about the amount. It's the attitude. And so if all you can, I remember Janie became partners with Brother Copeland, not, not Brother Brother Hagen, at $3 a month while I was out at Tulsa. And they sitting here the same stuff that somebody was giving $25 a month got. They were probably losing money on her. But the magazine and all the stuff they gave for, for the gift, they, she was probably, they were probably losing money as it were. But you know what? That's okay because see the principle has been established. They're sowing and they'll reap. Amen. <clears throat> and over time, as they reap, their sowing will increase. Amen. It's not like, a, see, God's thing is not like a lot of these uh, investment guys who front load the daylights out of you on their, on their uh, stuff. They'll hit you on the front end because they're getting ready to retire. And it'll take you 20 years to catch up and get, when they, they're, they're fees. They'll, they'll, they'll heavy load you on the front end and get their money out on the front end of your investments. And then they go retire. Then it takes you five, ten years to bank up all the money they got, and then your stuff kicks in later on. I, I've, I've seen people do that. They just, they hit heavily later. Look over in Luke 21. Hallelujah. It says, and he looked up and saw the rich men casting their gifts into the treasury. And he, and he saw a certain poor widow casting in thither two mites. And, of he, and, and he said, of a truth, I say unto you, this poor woman hath cast in more than they all. Not just well, any one of them, all of them. For all these have their, of their abundance cast in unto the offerings of God, but she of her penury hath cast in all the living that she had. Hello? He said, well, she gave more than all of them. Wow. She had the right heart. Now, there are people who give because they want to be seen. Now, not everybody, not everybody gives a big offer and wants to be seen, but I'm saying there's people. See, if you've got the wrong, see, we, we've got to find a lifestyle of impure motive, of, of, of pure motives, not impure, but pure motives, where we're doing things out of a pure heart for the right reasons to advance the kingdom of God and to establish the kingdom of God. Not so we can go around and tell everybody how much we did. Or the fake, you don't want to tell anybody how much you get. Well, you know, I, but I, you know, look, I really don't want to say how much I give. I don't want to embarrass anybody because, you know, I, I, you know the, the, my gift was, was, was of a size that would, you know, then you got your, oh, he gave a big one. So I've seen people do all kinds. Of, listen, you've been around long enough, you, you hear it all. Hello? I want to give a big offering, but I don't want anybody to know it. Well, now I know it. Hello? Let's be givers out of our heart. Amen? Money, and let me say this. This is, this is one of the things we run into in the church, and this has got to stop. People will use their money to govern the church. We've got to stop that mess. We have to have the right attitude. Amen. Number one, you go to this church, you tithe to this church. It's not your money in the first place. It's God's. Two, if you give offerings, 
Y'all know one time we had someone that, that, that attended our ministry, our church, and, and they were given six and a half times a month away to other ministries and they gave to their own local church. How do you know? They told me. They were given X number amount to the local church a week and they had 26 other ministries they were given to every month. And so the six and a half times that they were given to the local church, way, way out. I think, man, you know, things we could do for our city with, with that kind of, you know, well, I'm helping you on support ministries. Well, you know what? Hallelujah. Let's put things in perspective and balance. What's your local church going to do? They're going to pray for your kids. They're going to be at the hospital in the midnight hour. They're going, you know, you're going to pick up the phone, call your pastor. You're going to get him. Call traveling guy. See what you get. Honestly, now, that's what I think we should support different ministries. That should be done. But, you know, the, the, the local church comes first. Amen. It's a storehouse. It's where God wants to, God, it's where God brings people to. The traveling ministry ought to be pointing people to the storehouse. And into the storehouse. And those inside the local church should be working to facilitate the advancement of what God's doing there. And not be concerned about whether they get credit or, or be seen or whether, whatever, whatever, whatever. All the wrong attitudes. We just come up with a litany of wrong attitudes this, and we don't want to do that. What I am saying is we have to have the right heart. Don't ever feel like yours is not enough just because you can't compare to somebody that's got, you know, well, Pastor, I'm going to give $5,000 to that. Well, praise the Lord. Pastor, I'm going to give 50 cents to that. Hallelujah. Now, what are we rejoicing in? Not the fact that you can only give 50 cents. No, we're rejoicing in the fact that your heart's right and you're giving. You're going to grow up one day and you're going to be down the road. One of the hardest things I ever did was sit down with someone who was struggling financially, who couldn't, who didn't have the money to tithe and tell them, you can't afford not to tithe. Well, my heart once I look, God understands, it's okay. That's what I wanted to say. But I said, you can't afford not to. Why? Because the biblical principle of tithing and the glory returning unto you and causing you to increase would be thwarted and stopped in their life if they didn't. It was hard. I did not, listen, it was hard. I wanted to say something different. But see, I couldn't afford not to say what the Word said. I had to say what the Word said and not what I felt like saying. See, you can't counsel, ministers, you can't counsel people on how you feel. You have to counsel according to what the Word says. You see, your, your emotions get involved, your, your, uh, your feelings get involved, and you'll start counseling people according to the soul and not to according to the Word. And didn't the Bible say that the, that the wisdom of this world is enmity against God? So you'll, st you'll slip over into the wisdom of this world and get out of the wisdom of God. Hello? Well, they started tithing. And it wasn't a month, a month and a half. They got a raise at work. Within a year's time, they were making more money tithing than they were making the year before not tithing. I'm talking about more money left over after tithing than they were making before when they weren't tithing. The principal kids kicked in and started working for them. See, I could have left them in that place continuing to go down. I could tell them the truth. Amen? And they, want, they wanted to. They just, they just need somebody to encourage them to go ahead. They, and it worked. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So we're going to become givers. Now, the, the last thing. We're going to stop. We're going to move off of that. The last point. Learn to witness. You got you to gotta share the truth with others. If you do not have a release valve to the truth in your heart to other people, you'll become stagnant. And your, uh, your joy in serving the Lord will all be all about what can you get. And I'm going to tell you something, there's nothing more powerful and nothing more fulfilling than ministering to others in your own time of need. Can you say amen? Find the scripture on the woman at the, at the well. The passage. Now Jesus said in Acts 1.8, uh, told them to go tarry in Jerusalem, that they'll receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon them, and there'll be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost part of the earth. 
But remember Jesus. Been, been, on, long, been on a campaign, been ministering. And I'm going to tell you something. Um, look over in John chapter 4 while we're get, getting there. John 4. Let's just start in verse 1. When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, that Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee. And he must needs go through Samaria. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called uh, Sychar, or Sychar, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his... Uh, oh, if you're in faith in the Holy Ghost, you'll never get tired. Jesus did. I said, Jesus did. See, we, we get stupid with stuff sometimes. Oh, I got the faith that I'll never get tired. And you might fall over dead one day at 30. The, the body has to have rest. I said, the body has to have rest. Can you say amen? It's not, it's not faith that you're going out there. and The old Pentecostal preachers used to say, I'd rather burn out than rust out. And they did. They burnt slam out and went on home. Amen. One, one, one guy told Brother Hagin, I, I'm just, that's a little side journey away from, you know, uh, witnessing. He said, what do you, th what do you do in the, what do you take? Or whatever, because they were all taking something to get them up in the mornings. One guy said, he sat on the side of his bed 15 minutes just to get one sock on after the, the next day after a meeting. I just preached, I just practiced the word. And he gave himself rest. See, you know, that's the one thing you've got to do. Remember, Jesus withdrew himself oftentimes to go pray and to get away from everything. He, he needed rest. All right? Just through that, that, that's free. All right. The, Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. Uh, let's see here. So about, about noon. Hallelujah. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away to the city to buy meat. Now, he, 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 look, I'm going to sit here. You guys go get something and bring it back to me. Now, what's that mean? If they've gone to buy meat, Jesus is probably what? Tired and hungry. So weary and hungry that he stops and lets them go ahead. Okay? Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest, drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria, for the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Now, the Samaritans were in, in don't, don't get upset with me, but the, the vernacular would be half-caste or, or uh, you know, mixed breed. They were, they were part Jew, part Samarian. They weren't full blood. When Sherry used to have it, her song, half-breed. Okay? So all kinds of different terms. And they, they weren't all of one race. All right? It's not a racist term. It's just, you know, and, and the Jews were prejudiced against them because they weren't full of Jew. And she, so Jesus says, give me something to drink. She says, why are you talking to me? Because y'all don't talk to us. All right? And Jesus said, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that said to you, give me a drink, you would ask, have asked of me or him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman said unto her, sir, thou hast nothing to draw with. And she, she, she ain't got it yet. I'm going to tell you something. A lot of times you start talking to people spiritual stuff, they don't get it. That's okay. Don't quit. Let the Holy Ghost have some time to work on them. You got, see, you've got to break through the carnal thinking and get to the spiritual thinking. Amen. And then Jesus did that. He said, you know, he, you know she said, he says, you know, uh, she said, <laughs> he said, she said, he said, he said, he stop. I looked up there, it wasn't up there, so I had to come back over here. Woman said, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence hast thou that living water? In other words, you know, now she's thinking carnal. She's thinking, man, now that's a long way down that well, and you don't have anything to get down there and get that water out with, so how are you going to give me living water? And Jesus, and then she goes on and says, Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us of the well, and drank there of himself and his children and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. In other words, he's going, he's, going to make this, he's going to draw the parallel from natural to spiritual. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. 
But the water that I shall give, he, give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. And the woman said unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. And Jesus said unto her, Go call thy husband and come hither. And the woman said, I have no husband. And Jesus said, Yep, you've well said you have no husband. But you've had five. And the guy you're shacking up with now is not your husband. You did tell the truth. Now, I just, I just modernized the English here, but that's what it said. And, of course, she goes over oh, real quick. She, gets real, she figures this out real quick. Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. <laughs> Amen. Now, this, they go on this conversation, you know, and, and she's, you know, well, let's, let me just go ahead and read it. Our fathers worshiped in this place. In this mountain, you say that in Jerusalem is a place where we ought to worship. Um, Jesus said, woman, believe me that the hour comes that ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, you know not what. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. It can, you know, this is coming through the Jews. But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers of God shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And she said, I know that Messiah comes, which is called Christ. When he has come, he would tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I that speak unto thee am he. Really, he just said am. Then came his disciples and marveled that he taught with this woman, yet no man said, while talkest to her, or why talk, uh, why talk, uh, why, uh, what seekest thou, or why talkest to her? And the woman then left her water pot, went her way into the city, came to the men, come see a man which told me all things ever I did. Is this not the Christ? They went out of thy city and came unto him. In the meanwhile, while she's gone, his disciples prayed him or asked him, saying, Master, eat. And he, or in other words, they're trying to get him to eat. He said, I have meat to eat, you know not of. Now they say they can be just as carnal as the woman at the well. Therefore, said his disciples one to another, Have any man brought him all to eat? See, so right straight to the natural. And Jesus said, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Say ye not there your four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look unto the fields, for they are white already to harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto eternal life, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And herein is that saying true, one soweth and another reapeth. I sent you to reap where, um, that whereon you bestowed no labor. Other men labored, and you entered into their labors. Now, all that to get to this. What was Jesus when he first showed up at the well? What was his physical status? Hungry and tired, tired and hungry. After he ministered and witnessed to the Samaritan woman, what was his status? They couldn't even get him to eat when they showed up with the food. The satisfaction of witnessing satisfied physical hunger. It's a new Weight Watchers plan. Go witness. You won't eat as much. That went over big. Hello? I thought it was a pretty cool plan. You get people saved at the same time and, and, you, and you lose weight and get people saved. What's a better deal? Y'all can lighten up. Notice that Jesus said, my meat, my sustenance. Now, he's, he's referring to substance. He's not talking about, you know, lamb or whatever. He is talking about food. But his, my, he, he kind of took it there and went, my sustenance, my sustenance is what? To do his will. To do the will of the Father. Now, think about that for a second. If Jesus' meat or sustenance came from doing the will of the Father, that should tell us something as the church. He said, be imitators of me, as, be imitators of God as dear children. What should we be doing? One of the things that's going to help you grow spiritually more, more than getting a zuzu or a wham wham. Randy Greer, you talked about when they were in prison, when they, got, when they got cigarettes and they got stuff, you know, all the stuff they weren't, contraband they weren't supposed to get, they refer to them in prison as zuzus and wham whams. Okay? What gave, what gave, Jesus' satisfaction and what should be given the church satisfaction is not that you got a new car. Now, I'm going to tell you something. That's, 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 that is uh, toddler 
to childhood stage. Come on. Because see, there comes a day in your life when things like Christmas is not about all about what you get. You want to give. You don't care if your kids got you a Christmas present or not. They're, they don't have the means or the whatever and, you know, uh, uh, to, to do it. You want to give, you want to bless them. What's that? You've matured. And see, in, in our charismatic word of faith circles and prosperity teaching, see, the babes are all, and the, the toddlers and the infants and the, the children are still running around talking about all the stuff they're getting. But those who've learned what prosperity is about and have matured are now focusing on winning the loss with their finances. How can they help the church get the job done that needs to be gotten done, not how can I give money so I can get a Mercedes? Which preacher can I put more money into their pocket so I can have instant debt cancellation? Go read your Bible. The sudden things in the Bible were usually a long time in taking place. Now, if you go back and study, the Holy Ghost was promised a long time before the suddenly. Hello? At that moment, it was a suddenly. There was a sudden event at that moment, but that had been long in the planning. Long in, in think God doing things in the earth to prepare for that. Amen. Remember, I remember, you know about that, uh, it's, it's either a bamboo or some kind of uh, tree or something over in the Orient that it grows like 60 feet in just, uh, how, many, how many days? Just, I mean, like a short month, two months, something, something crazy. But it lays in the ground somewhere between 60 and 100 years. Dormant in the ground. And then when it, it, it was, look, it suddenly shot up. No, 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 it's been laying there for, for decades getting ready for that. Amen? So you begin to, when you begin to grow in the things of God, you begin to realize, you know, that some of those suddenlies were really long in preparation. Amen? But you're not going to run off to this, this special meeting and get a suddenly that everything's going to be paid off next week. Here, here a little, there a little, line upon line, precept upon precept. We go from faith to faith and from glory to glory. And... The preparation of your heart has to take place so that you know what to do when you get the return. Learn to be a witness. Learn to support the church so it can do its job to reach people. Amen? But I'm going to tell you something. Just, now listen, just giving the money is not going to be enough for people. <coughs> well, <coughs> I, I people, you know, I, I give and, you know, I'll fund it, you go do it. Well, that's not. You've got to have the heart to go do it. Amen. Amen. Isn't that right? All right. Praise God. So there you go. Learn to forget. Learn to forgive, learn to pray, learn to believe, learn to worship, learn to give, and learn to witness. You've got to be a witness. Isn't that right? 